Department of uh, Chemical, Environmental, and Materials Engineering. And I'm also civil, I mean, it's civil, and I'm still in civil architecture. She's an environmental engineer, okay, so perfect. she can wear many hats. Okay. <laughs> Uh, her research is mainly on environmental measurements related to things that affect human health. And she got her master's and um, bachelor's uh, here at the University of Miami. Uh, she went on to do her PhD in environmental engineering at MIT. And then she came back and joined the faculty in 1995. Correct. Okay. So she has been here ever since. And she's an extremely accomplished researcher. She has published hundreds. 150 papers, I think, in the biosketch. And uh, she has got funding from pretty much any agency that funds her kind of research. Uh, we are actually very excited to have you here, Helena. And I look forward to, to your talk. Well, thank you, Luis. Thank you, Kanoi. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to present. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's very rare that we have a whole hour. Uh, I'm accustomed when I do presentations, I'm given 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but in this case, I have a whole hour. And so I thought it would be useful to break the presentation up. And I was also thinking, what is it that I want this audience to remember? What do I want this audience to remember? This audience is civil and architectural engineering dealing with construction materials. We also have environmental engineering, chemical engineering, materials engineering. The one thing that I think relates and I want everyone to know, and I do feel like I have a responsibility to explain, is this. I want to make sure that when you leave here, you remember wood, especially if it's green. And you know, I have gloves on because this wood has a toxic chemical in it for arsenic. So when you finish this seminar, I'd like for you to make sure you remember wood, the green wood. I'd like for you to remember the acronyms CCA, PFAS. I'd like for you to remember SARS-CoV-2. I think many of you know, may know what that is given our COVID epidemic. But I wanted to start my conversation with my true love, which is research that focuses in on bacteria and each. And that's why I have a smiley face here because I love those kinds of studies. Um, I love to study and understand why bacteria are elevated at the beach. And so everything sort of comes back to that when I do research, but there's always these other opportunities that spin off and things happen. And so I end up in all these other topic areas. I love any topic that relates measurements in the environment to human health. I usually do the measurements. I design the sampling program. But I also work with epidemiologists. I work with uh, people who understand people and how they behave. And so we combine our forces together so that we can understand and relate what we see in the environment to human health. Okay, so I wanted to mention um, my research is very diverse and I wanted to represent my PhD students. I think some of them may be asked to present during the seminar series. So I want to start off with my PhD students and what they're doing. Uh, Again, my, my first love, if there's ever a project I can do, Bacteria at the Beach, I'm there. Uh, and the work at Bacteria in the Beach, I'm, I currently don't have anything active where we're actively sampling at the beach, but um, we do have a spin-off project from that. We found, we were contracted by the village of Key Biscayne, a very well-to-do community. They had a lot of bacteria in their beaches and they had to close their beaches down because of the bacteria, so they contracted us to figure out why were they getting so much bacteria on the beach. Well, it came, what we understood from our study is that it's coming from the sand, and what's fueling the sand is seaweed. We're getting tons of seaweed coming into the environment. We have been, we have records of seaweed for the last two decades through remote satellite imagery, and then we actually have measurements from the city of Fort Lauderdale. The city of Fort Lauderdale has their own seaweed removal program. So we have their records for 13 years. And you can see the amount of seaweed is getting higher, 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 and higher. But last five years, it's like a straight line going up. So there's so much seaweed. What do we do with it? I personally think that the seaweed is being fueled by climate change. I think a small change in the temperature of the ocean sort of magnifies the seaweed. And I think that that's 
That's what's fueling this increase in the seaweed that we're looking at. Um, I, I find that the bacterial aspects of the seaweed to be fascinating, but my PhD student, Afifa, is fascinated by compost and making compost. And so um, she was so motivated for this that we, she wrote two proposals and she got both of them funded. And so from that perspective, I'm in the seaweed business in compost, but mainly because of Afifa, because of my PhD student Afifa, and it really fuels down to her passion and her desire. She really loved this topic area. And I love working on this, and I love working on this mainly because she's so enthusiastic. And it's a really important problem, but I'm still, I still want to look at the, the bacteria. But we've been moving into compost. Um, in addition to that, so I, again, I love to look at beaches. I don't always have the opportunity to look at bacteria on beaches, and it usually spins off to something else. Another spinoff of beaches work is, you know, back in April 20th of 2010, we had a huge oil spill, BWH explosion, which resulted in this massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that resulted in oil coming back to beaches. That set up a huge consortium, $500 million, that funded research to look at oceanography and impacts to the coastline. And so we applied for funding for that project, and we got it. Um, it was very difficult. We applied multiple times, but finally we got it. And this, the focus of this study was to look at children at beaches and their risks to um, oil contaminated sand. Again, I, I'm obsessed with sand at the beach and I love to look at the bacteria in the sand, but the oil is also very important from an environmental human health perspective. And so um, my student, Larissa Montas, is currently working on finishing up that study. We, we've closed that study up. We're finishing it up and writing the papers, finalizing the papers. And I think she's been invited to present. So she will be discussing the work on oil contaminated beaches. And uh, she's done some really nice work um, understanding the environmental distribution of the various chemicals. Oil is very complex. It's a mixture of a lot of different chemicals. It's hard to study. And um, she's been able to break it down and come up with some interesting stories on the oil uh, distribution um, at the beach. So uh, that brings us to, that's how the beaches work has sort of splintered off into seaweed and into oil. But there's another area of research that I have worked on for decades at the university. My, under, my, uh, my PhD research focused on contaminant transport. I, looked, I studied a river up in Massachusetts. We developed models to simulate arsenic, chromium, copper, and iron transport through that river. I came to University of Miami as a faculty member, and you know, our environment here is pretty pristine. We don't have industry, much industry. So the, the environmental contamination from a perspective of metals, not really here. It was really a struggle at the very beginning to try to find the niche and how can I combine my expertise with metals transport and moving flowing waters and the environment. Um, and so there was this RFP that came out my, my first year or second year I was here and it talked about arsenic, chromium, and copper. I said, oh, those are three of the four metals that I study. Maybe I should do research in this area. And that's how I got involved. And I've been working on this for about two and a half decades on CCA. CCA, chromated copper arsenic. Let me write that out. So again, I, I told you at the beginning of this lecture, that I want you to remember a few things. I want you to remember the wood, the green wood, and it has arsenic in it. I want you to remember at least remember CCA. You don't have to remember what it stands for, but I'm going to write it up. And that stands for chromated copper. And I'm probably falling off the screen here. Oh, no. no so I arsenate. This brass part means that there's arsenic in it. So early on, when I started here at the faculty, I said, well, let me give this a shot. I didn't, you know. Uh, let's see if we can get some funding in this. And we applied, and lo and behold, we studied this for 20 years after we started um, doing the research on it. It's a fascinating story, but even before I get into the story of CCA treated wood, I want to talk about PFAS. PFAS is another acronym I want you to remember. I have two PhD students working on PFAS, and that's the, and again, you don't have to remember what PFAS actually stands for, just remember PFAS, but it's poly. And per 
fluorinated alkyl alkyl substances. And these are chemicals that are stain resistant, that are water resistant. It's probably in the treated wood as well, because uh, to preserve wood, they add uh, water repellents. And so it's in a lot of building materials, it's in a lot of consumer products, and all of these consumer products end up in a landfill. And then the landfill, there's liquid in the landfill, and that liquid then starts to leach out, and it carries with it PFAS. PFAS has been associated with a lot of illnesses, especially illnesses associated with the thyroid. Very strong connection with human health. And a very fortunate in that by happenstance, I had an undergraduate student. Her name was Athena. She was in my class 340, and I always assigned a project in 340. And the project I got from the student was amazing. I, I mean, I had never seen anything like it. It was just it was jaw dropping to me and it was about PFAS. And you know, I said, okay, well, you know, PFAS, you know, it sort of stayed in the back of my mind. I remember that project. And so when she graduated, I, I asked her, do you want to do research? And she said, yes. And I said, at that time I had CCA research. So, okay, and she, she agreed, okay, yeah, let's work on CCA treated wood research. After a year of working on treated wood research, she, we went up for a competition um, on solid waste management. And uh, I contacted some people I know. I go, what's hot in the field of, of disposal of solid waste? And they mentioned, I had a feed on the phone, and they mentioned PFAS. So I was still in love, and I still am in love with CCA, and I wanted to continue working on CCA. But Athena wrote a proposal on PFAS. And so we were competing head to head. I helped her with the proposal. But we were still competing head to head, and her project was funded and mine was not. So that's how I dropped out of the CCA business temporarily. Uh, I, I still envision myself going back, um, but now I'm full steam ahead with PFAS and I have two excellent PhD students, Mikhail Chen and Kai Bang, working on PFAS and multiplying PFAS in the environment from leachates. We're looking at different kinds of landfills, uh, municipal solid waste landfill, construction demolition landfills, ash landfill. We're looking at gas condensate, stormwater, groundwater at landfills. Really interesting work, very complex because PFAS is really a combination of thousands of chemicals. And it's, it's difficult to quantify and difficult to, once you do quantify, you have all these different species, how do you explain it? So it's a very challenging era, topic area to be able to um, express in a paper when it's such so complex. But um, they're doing a wonderful job and I, I can't wait. Um, to continue working on it. It's been a blessing in disguise. And I'm very happy, actually I'm very happy. You know, I, I love working on PFAS. So I just wanna let you give you a little bit of history as to sometimes when you think you're going in a certain direction, opportunity comes and you sometimes get diverted. I still wanna get back into CCA, but there's another opportunity that has come my way having to do with COVID. SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID. And that came about because the work that we do in beaches, uh, we were funded through Oceans of Human Health for a period of about 10 years. And one of the goals of that, of that group, of my, the group I worked with, was to come up with ways to analyze beach water, not only for the bacteria, but for viruses and protozoans. We even looked at worms, hemp homes. And we came up with devices to do the, you know, separate the sample so we can do this with the, this top filter could be used for this, and the bottom filter was for the viruses. And you know, we had interesting combinations but during that time, it was so hard because the, the technology was about 10 years ago. The technology was not that well developed in terms of the molecular science part of it. But because of this COVID, we got these opportunities where we applied what we learned at bacteria in the beaches with other biologists. We, we looked at viruses at that time, and it led to this research here on SARS CoV 2. And it's, I'm going to present, therefore, on two things. I'm going to present on CCA, a short presentation on CCA, and I'm going to do a short presentation on the work that is currently active on SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so on CCA treated wood, again, you want me to yes, share the yes, if you can do the screen share, I appreciate it. But on CCA treated wood, again, I, um, it's important for me because I want to make sure everyone's aware of the toxicity associated with this wood so that when you work with it, it's a very common building material that when you work with it, 
you don't expose yourself. Maybe warn others that you run into about the potential need to handle this carefully. All right, so I'm gonna take off my gloves because I'm no longer touching the wood. And actually, if you look at my glove, I have green on my glove, which means that some of the chemical rubbed off from the wood. Okay. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, um, I've been working on this since 1995. I'm working on the impact, the environmental impacts of treated wood. Uh, I'm going to describe it in the Florida sector, but the work that we did not only Im impacted Florida, impacted nationally and internationally. This wood has since been banned from residential use as effective 2004. And it resulted in policies in other countries, not only in Florida, but in the United States and in other countries. So to give you a sense of CCA treated wood, it's a very common building material. Any wood that is used in the outdoor environment has to be treated. The reason being wood is a food substance for a lot of organisms out there. Fungi consume it, termites consume it. So you, if you want wood to last, especially in our environment, our warm, humid environment, if you're in the Arctic, you don't have to worry about it. But here in South Florida, it's gonna degrade within a year. You have to have the wood treated. And I sort of have this dilemma in my mind because you want the wood treated, so you don't want the wood to deteriorate, but yet you don't want it to be toxic either. You know, these woods, the wood is a structural material. You don't want that to fall. And to me, okay, yeah, we want to put as much chemical in there. We want it to last. We want to make sure that the structural integrity of that wood is, is there. So, you know, there's that dilemma. But in addition to that, we also need to think in terms of, you know, it's being used. There's chemicals that are be, being released while it's being used. People can get exposed. To this, they may not know that their fence is made of treated wood, and then they put that fence and make it um, into, uh, and there have been cases like this where they make it into um, firewood, burn it in their home, and the whole family, yeah, they passed. So there have been those cases um, in terms of people not realizing the, the extent to which this wood can cause problems. You also see a utility pole there, it's a dark green that has more chemical in it. Then we spent a lot of time in the disposal set trying to understand how to separate the wood. How do you separate the wood out um, when you have a mixture? This is good. We want to recycle wood. We want to recycle wood that's been disposed. But if it's contaminated with CCA, we can't. The, the recycling options are limited to contaminated. So this project really we worked uh, myself and Tim Townsend um, over two and a half uh, two and a half decades, and then now I'm working with Tim Townsend on his PFAS. So I'm um, very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with him over these years. Um, and it's been a great collaboration. Um, he's an expert in solid waste. Okay, how do I? Uh... There we go. So I'm gonna give you a bit, little bit of uh, background. How did we get started with this? Why were they interested in funding treated wood research, I mean, especially the environmental impact? Just to emphasize, uh, in the state of Florida, we have massive sugarcane fields just south of Lake Okeechobee. That's Sorry, you can see that bar here inside, but they online on Zoom, they see the whole thing. Okay, that's okay. I, I'm not sure how to minimize that. Okay, that's all right. You can just leave it. Um, but in, in the state of Florida, we have these major areas of sugarcane. The sugarcane, a little bit of history about the sugarcane industry in the state of Florida. Uh, the, the owners of the sugarcane fields, the, the major own, owners, actually came from Cuba. In Cuba, there was a revolution. I mean, Cuba was a major supplier of sugar. And because of the revolution, a lot of the people who owned plantations had to leave. And one of the families came over and then established sugarcane in Florida. And so this has a very interesting uh, history because of its connection to Cuba and then now the environmental aspects associated with it. But we have some major sugarcane fields in the state of Florida, south of Lake Okeechobee. And the sugarcane industry in uh, South Florida, we have these massive cogeneration plants. One called o Osceola, the other one called Opilanta. I think Osceola has been closed. But what they do at these cogeneration plants is they take the baguettes from sugarcane. So when you make sugar, you, you have a, a stalk. 
and you squeeze the liquid sugar out of that stock, but you have that vegetative stock that's left over, that's the big ass. They would then take the big ass, they would burn it and make electricity out of it. And then they would take that, that they could sell the electricity. It was so profitable that Florida Power and Light was buying their electricity, they were making a lot of money. Um, and then they would take the ash that was formed from the burning and then they would land apply it because it was a nice lining agent. So it was a hugely beneficial recycling operation for the sugar industry. So just to give you a little bit more on the flow chart, you start with the sugar cane, which are those stalks. You squeeze, they put, you put it through a press, you squeeze it, out comes the liquid. And from that liquid, they produce the sugar. And then the byproduct, the vegetative byproduct called the gas, then goes to a cogeneration plant. At that cogeneration plant, they then use, they burn the big ass to form energy. They would then take that ash and it would be cycled back to um, put on the fields and cycle back essentially to produce more, more sugar cane. So it was a really nice process and it was very profitable. They said, well, you know, we don't, they, they didn't have enough of the gas. They wanted to make more energy. So they wanted to go beyond the baguette and get other sources of wood or, um, or organic material that they can burn. So they started accepting recycled wood. So in, in South Florida, we have these large facilities. You know, we're, we're very compact, it's very highly urban. We have a lot of construction, demolition, and it all goes to these centralized facilities that sort out the different materials. So they extract the wood and then they started taking the wood because it costs money to dispose of the wood. So they started saying, give it to us or we'll charge you half of what the landfills charge. And so they started actually making money just accepting the wood. And then they would burn it, make electricity, so that electricity. But lo and behold, the surprise, they ended up with arsenic in their ash. Nobody expected this. And I remember when I first started, they suspected treated wood, but that really was doing this? Can this really be the reason? Or I mean, the ash that you I mean, this facility is humongous, just and the mounds of ash, I mean, it's just mountains. And just to get the thought that the wood will contaminate it to this level. And so that's how we started the project, is we were tasked with trying to figure out, is there really enough wood out there that's being disposed to cause these elevated levels of arsenic in the ash? And the answer is yes. And so if you don't look, you know, learn a little bit more about CCA and CCA treated wood. Uh, CCA, um, typically the type of wood that is used to make CCA is Southern Yellow Pine. They, it's very porous wood. And then they add the chemical to it at different retention levels, anywhere from four to 40 kilograms per meter cube. That's 40 kilograms of chemical per cubic meter of wood. And the amount that they add to the wood depends on what the wood's going to be used for. It can be above ground applications. They put a little bit. So this is an above ground. This is the lowest retention level, but you can still see the green. Then, um, but if you're going to use it for more aggressive environments, such as uh, saltwater splash zones or structural poles, or immersed in salt water, you go all the way up to 40. And looking at the numbers, though, in terms of the levels of chemical, we have at the lowest retention level, four kilograms per, per cubic meter, arsenic at 1,700 milligrams per kilogram. At the highest retention level, 40 kilograms per meter cubic. Oh, 1,700 milligrams per kilogram. 1,700, 17,000, I think. 17,000 milligrams per kilogram is 1.7 by weight, 1.7 percent by weight. So we have 1.7 percent of arsenic by weight, 1.9 percent chromium. And copper at one point took five percent of the weight of this wood. Is Just arsenic, chromium, copper, not even that counting the oxides. Okay, so it's a pure metal. It's five percent. That's amazing. It's amazing. And that's why the technology works in terms of separating and identifying. It's so at such high levels. But when comparing this to human health guidelines. We usually use the soil cleanup target levels, which is used by the state of Florida to determine whether or not a material can be recycled as um, by recycled by putting it on land. And so we use soil cleanup target levels for that purpose. And for residential applications, the amount of arsenic that would be allowed in a material is 2.1 milligrams per kilogram. So we're putting a material in there that is anywhere from 1,700 to 17,000 arsenic 
northern immigrant. And we want our mulch to say we're making, mixing out of making the mulch. If we want it to have be within the residential guidelines, we have this whole circle here of that untreated wood pile, less than 4%, 0.4% can be treated. So if you're sorting 100 pounds of wood, less than half a pound can be in the form of treated wood. I mean, your accuracy in sorting and separation needs to be incredible in order to be able to recycle construction demolition wood for purposes of uh, making mulch, as an example, or even for cogeneration. So what happens with treated wood? The, wood? the disposal issue is not what caused the change. What caused the change in the use of treated wood was because of human health impacts. At this time, there were not only our group, there's a couple other groups, one in Canada um, and another one, um, looking at the impacts to children from the wood. They, make, they, they, make, they were making, and there's still playgrounds out there with this because it lasts so long because it doesn't degrade, but they were making playground out of this with a high retention level. And in carrying this wood here from my office, my gloves are green. Okay, so I know the chemical is on my gloves. And we did studies to look at children's um, exposure while they were playing. And this is a, a picture from our study. And the way we do that is we wash the children's hands ahead of time. We do a blank with their clean hands. Then we you know, just let them play on their own playground. They would play, and then we would wash their hands after, and we could get to our students in the, in the solution. So if that child is now putting their hands in their mouths or on their faces, that's an issue. And there were studies to look at risks from that route. Arsenic does, not very highly, but it does go through skin. So even just touching it, you will get you know, the, the chances of getting sick from skin exposure is much less than if they put their hands in their mouth. But still, why are we exposing children to arsenic? Why are we exposing ourselves to arsenic? I mean, you picnic tables out of this. So, yeah. And so, effective 2004, this wood is no longer allowed to be manufactured. You, you can still have the structures out there. Again, these, this wood lasts forever. Um, it lasts up to 40 years. Uh, but you cannot make new wood, wood intentional for residential applications. They can still make it for marinas. They can still make it for utility poles. So if you go to a marina and you see the green wood out there, that's CCA. That green wood and the high retention level. Remember, that's a, that's a saltwater immersion application. You can just imagine 5% by weight from the copper arsenic. Effective 2004, there are now some alternatives to CCA. So when you are specifying um, wood for building and construction purposes, um, there is borate treated wood, but borate um, comes out really easily. There's also copper-based preservatives that don't have the arsenic, but they have more copper. Micronized um, and dissolved um, uh, copper base, such as ACQ, or copper boron azol. The levels, I mean, again, the levels of metals, again, they have more copper but less arsenic so they have no arsenic in them which is good and then also just keeping in mind the difficulties whenever there is a preservative wood out there the difficulties and the ease with which it is to contaminate clean sources of wood this is what recyclers have to deal with when we went out to these recycling facilities way back like in the early 2000s we could take a sample from here and you can tell there's arsenic at pretty good levels there were BMPs that were put in place, best management practices that were put in place in the state of Florida. Those BMPs were adopted as part of the Florida Administrative Code, and now wood recyclers are required to do certain steps before they can recycle the wood. And now we've collected the wood, we've gone back out to these facilities, and they've improved. So this is a picture of Athena, who beat me out, uh, testing the wood. This is before we started PFAS, um, testing the wood to confirm that the quality is is good. Okay, so this is recycled wood from construction demolition activities. They, they dye it, they put the red iron oxide on it, and then they resell it, and, and you, you see it in, in all over Florida. A little bit on the history. Um, we did a lot of work. This is the, the 1900s. We did a lot of work trying to confirm the different preservatives over time. And I'm sorry, maybe I can move this little thing so you can at least see. 
the axis. And then you can see the explosion of 3D wood in the 70s when they discovered PCA. We see it smack and then 2004 the big drop off. And eventually, what I'd like to see this is the use of utility code in the marina. And this is why I don't think my work is done on PCA. I want to get back to this eventually, but I'm just too distracted with COVID. -19. But once things calm down with COVID, maybe time permits, I like to come back and we'll explore utility codes and arenas. Um, maybe there's some alternatives that are out there for those uses. So that's the first presentation I just wanted to share. So thank you. Okay, this is a few minutes early here. Yeah. So I have a second presentation. So yeah. any questions? Yeah. There was one question that I asked about CQ. So can you say a little bit about CQ and uh, maybe about why it's used it was also declined over the last five generations? Yes, ACQ is alkal alkaline copper quartz. And ACQ was one of the first alternatives that were developed. And uh, it, the problem is that the, cop, C, the, the CCA, the reason it's CCA is because arsenic is there for the terminal. The copper is there for the fungi, the chromium for the fixing agent. So when, when the, the chemical binds and cut inside the wood, the chromium binds, the arsenic binds the copper. But the ACQ did not have chromium. And so they didn't have a way of really fixing the copper inside the wood. So it would, out, outdoors it rains, it just comes out. But since then they've developed alternatives, the micronized copper azole, MCA. And what they did with that is instead of adding it as a, a liquid, as a dissolved material, they're adding it as like these microspheres of copper. So it they, they push it in and physically those microspheres cannot come back out. And so the copper now remains, it, it's not a chemical fixing agent, it's more of a physical based on size fixing process. So that's why ACQ, although it was, it was used as an alternative for a period of time <clears> that lost its use. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, hello, oh. Dr. Solo. Yes. Yes, there's another question, and it's about the charge of these elements, I mean, arsenic, copper, and chrome, whether they are in terms of, uh, in, the, in the form of element or no, they are just in the combination with other chemicals. The way they're added to the wood, uh, we keep track of the arsenic, chromium, copper as the, met as the metal, but they are bound as oxides. So they are um, chromium oxide, ar arsenic as an oxide, and, and they have their corresponding salt that goes along with it. When they actually, the actual treating solution, um, we have the arsenate, the, the chromium oxide, and the copper oxide. So the, it means they are in bond with other elements and chemicals. Yeah, not the pure metal. No, it's not a pure metal. No, no, it's, okay. a, it's an oxide. It's a, it, yeah. Well, the copper, it, when it's in the li liquid, will dissociate and form copper plus two. And the yes. arsenic will stay as arsenate which is arsenic with the oxides. Yes. Thank the you so chromium, much. Yeah the, yeah, the chromium switches, uh, the way it's added to the wood is that's chromium six, which is very yes. toxic, but over time it converts to chromium three, which is less toxic. Yes, yes, different charges. Yes, yes. thank you so much. Sure. You had a question, Luis? Yeah, I was wondering, do you know the size of the particles that they infuse the wood with? You know, I don't know that I know it's micronized, but I don't know the okay. exact size, but we can look into that. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yes. yes. Well, thanks, Elena. Yeah, thank it was great. All right, let me switch the so the next talk that I'd like to go over. So I want to make sure you remember the wood. I'm going to show everybody the wood again. So whenever you see wood outdoors, I want you to think about CCA or think about the copper based alternatives. Think about the chemicals that may be in it. Think about CCA. So I'm hoping that you'll remember wood and you'll remember CCA from this presentation. Oh, okay. okay. Let me reshare that. Yeah, we're trying to set up the uh, screen to be appropriate. That better? Okay, thank right. you. Thank, thank you. you.
Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is our work looking at SARS-CoV-2. That's here, SARS-CoV-2, severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by coronavirus number two. This is the virus, the name of the virus that causes COVID. And I think it's affecting all of us. And so I think there's a general interest in this particular topic area. And that's why I also chose to focus on it. Um, we did receive some funding um, effective January of this year for a project called SF RAD. South Florida RAD. NIH had a competition called Radical, Radix RAD, and it's for ideas that are high risk, different, radical, so that they can get things out um, quickly. And the idea is that these are short term, it's a two year grant, and we have to get the, uh, the work out very fast. And our focus has been to develop a wastewater based surveillance infrastructure uh, at University of Miami. Um, and then also for the county as a whole, we're, we're looking at different scales at which this relationship between what we see in wastewater and human health. So I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about our work. And so what is it that, how does this work? Um, because it's really weird. If you have a respiratory disease, you know, that's where you get the transmission. You know, it, you would think it would be coming from person to person. But it also happens that COVID not only is transmitted from person to person, when people are sick, they excrete it. They excrete it in their feces, they excrete it in their urine. So it ends up in the, in the, in the woods. As far as transmission from the sewer, we don't think so. I treat it still as though we can get transmission from the sewer, but we don't think that it can be transmitted to the sewers. The reason being that SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. Um, and so that's the, weak, the weak, weak, weak link of the virus is that envelope layer, which we think is disintegrated once it goes into the sewage, but that we think that the virus still remains intact. Okay, so without the envelope, Theoretically, the virus cannot infect. So we don't think that what we're collecting is can be transmitted from one person to another, but we still wear masks. I still wear a shield in the lab. I, I just want to make sure that it's not transmitted in that fashion. So, but it is excreted. So when people are sick, they excrete it in their feces, they excrete it in their urine, it goes into the toilet and into the sewer. You can see our picture here of the COVID in the sewer. We then collect our sample. And then we purify that sample. We have go through a whole process of concentrating it, extracting the RNA, and then analyzing a part of that RNA sequence. My team, we are on the sample collection side collecting the sewage, but there's we have some brilliant molecular scientists that are awe inspiring as to what they can see. I am just, you know, I, I started with the oceans and human health, and we were struggling to find find ways to analyze these microorganisms in the environment. And it's amazing to see the revolution in the technology over a period of 10 years, where now we can see the, the virus. Not only can we see the virus in sewage, because seawater is a lot clean, cleaner than sewage from my perspective. Wastewater is really dirty. And yet, not only can they see the RNA, doing RNA in sewage is really hard, or any environmental sample, it's harder than DNA. Not only can they see the RNA, they can see variants. And, from extracted from the sewage. I, I'm just like, wow, I'm just like, this is amazing that, they, that we can actually do this and has advanced to this point. So um, pretty amazing technologies that are now available. And our objective is essentially pretty simple. We want to relate the wastewater measurements, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA measurements in the wastewater to the COVID-19 case. So that's what our goal is. Uh, another way to look at it is we're taking our wastewater numbers, we're combining it with human surveillance numbers, we know what the CCMB is contributing to that sewage source, we're putting it all together and data integration and standardization. I'm very accustomed to working with smaller scale projects without so many disparate sources of information. Data standardization has been huge in this project, trying to get it all together, human data combined with wastewater data, putting it all together so that we can characterize um, the outbreak. And we have epidemiologists that are doing that outbreak characterization. And then ideally, this is what we see in the sewage. We'd like to be used for making decisions about how to handle population or how, you know, are masks still required? Uh, do we open the cafeteria? Um, that kind of thing. 
my area and my my focus has been on wastewater but um, i'm going to give you the overall picture of the project and i'm going to get into some of the detail of wastewater specifically so our organization for our project is here we have three specific aims and uh, we have an administrative lead group we have three pi this is a three pi project myself and dr Scher from uh, the medical campus he's a information data person uh, and then Chris Mason from Cornell University, Wall Cornell Medical School. So, and then we also have George Brill, who's the director of shared resources at the Sylvester Cancer Center. He's the one who has brought us all together. And then we have leads for the various aims. We have one focus on data standardization, how to get all this data together. Another aim focused on wastewater, and then another aim where we put it all together. And then at the bottom, Feeding into all of these aims is a human population clinical patient surveillance. So we're also collecting information about the people, and we also are collecting samples at a hospital. So we're also getting patient information from the hospital to see if we can make this relationship. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, that's Chris Mason from Cornell, Stephen Schur, myself, and then George Grills. And these are our specific aims. Again, data standardization, wastewater, and integration with human health. We've been collecting samples since the end of, actually, I mean, we've had some practice samples, but we started collecting samples at the end of September 2020. And we have various experiments to go out weekly. Every week, we collect samples on campus and at the three campuses. Uh, we've also been doing specialized experiments, collecting daily samples. We've been collecting samples hourly. Um, up to this point in time, we have analyzed just a small portion of the data, uh, which is the fall semester data we published on it. Um, but we still, we're, we're inundated with a lot of information and we're still assimilating a lot of this information, but I'm gonna let you know what we learned from the fall semester. Um, two main points that we learned from the fall semester. One is how do you measure SARS-CoV-2? There's a traditional measurement method called RT-PCR. We reverse transcript tapes because in order to analyze what makes RNA so hard to, you know, RNA viruses so hard to analyze is because they're RNA. And in order to, for PCR to work, you have to have DNA. Well, most times. In order for RNA to work, the most traditional way, you have to have DNA. So you have to make, first you start with the RNA, you make a DNA, and then you, use, you, make, you make multiple copies of the DNA so they amplify um, using PCR. So the traditional method is called RTP-PCR. But my colleague at the medical campus his name is Mark Sharkey, he's the first author of this paper, developed a new method called B2G, which stands for volcano second generation, which has a special enzyme that doesn't require the synthesis of eDNA. And so he skips a step and it's a lot less expensive and it's in comparatively it provides very similar results. So we have a new technology that's been developed called B2G, qPCR. In addition to that, my colleague, uh, my epidemiologist colleagues, uh, Naresh Kumar and Alejandro Montero, have put the data together for the fall semester and have found that the way, what we see in the wastewater is predicted four days in advance. So what we see in the wastewater, we, we can predict what's gonna happen in the human population four days into, into the future. So that's what that bottom plot represents there. So we have some basics, that's a four day. And so what do we do? Uh, again, I, I do the sample collection side of things. To be honest, I don't like to measure wastewater. I'd rather be at the beach. Um, but it's so important that um, we do it. And I've come to terms with wastewater. So wastewater and I are now getting along better. <laughs> but, but anyway, the way we collect the wastewater, and I wanted to mention it because I brought this. This is, my, this is our sampling today. And just to let you know how things sort of one thing leads to another. Guess who invented this? Athena. So Athena is the one who made me go to PFAS. And to do PFAS and landfill leachate, we have to go down manholes like that are 30 feet deep. And the water is this deep at the bottom of the manhole. So how the heck do you get a sample all the way down there without pumping it? And so she devised this. And it's a really cool device. You just, you know, the way, you know, depending on how you set this up, it goes to the bottom and then you let it fill and you bring it. Very simple. But nobody really has devices for measuring sewers. So nobody analyzes sewage. I mean, we're not, we, we go to the wastewater plant to collect samples out there. It's very rare to want to collect a sample in a sewer. I mean, nobody, that sewers are for conveyance, not for quality. So 
Yeah, uh, so, so it's, Athena is still influencing me and <laughs> making an impact on what I'm doing. Um, so we, we transferred the technology from PFAS and now we use the same technology for our, our sewer. So this is the, the bottle on the chain that you see there. So, uh, so we collect a sample from the sewer in a two liter bottle. We then split it. One, one is used for water quality parameters, temperature, pH, salinity, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity. And the other one is goes to the University of Miami lab. This is our map, our sampling map on campus of where we collect our samples. Uh, we collect samples at all, all the dorms on campus. Uh, and that way we can isolate dorms as to which ones may have higher levels of COVID. Um, we also collect samples at clusters. So at WGO2 and WGO1, which this drains almost, you know, WGO2 drains this part of campus and then w, well, WGO1 drains this part. Here um, and so we can get a sense of overall campus numbers by these cluster scales. So we have individual building scale, we have cluster scale samples, and now we've expanded to the wastewater plant. So we have community scale. So this is what it looks like when we go sampling. Again, we have the device that Athena has invented that's central to what we do. This is a pump station. Uh, this is a manhole. You can see that we're very serious about personal protection. We wear lab coats, uh, gloves. Uh, we have water for cleansing. We have alcohol. We have also you see a secondary container. Our bottles are here. So if there is spillage, it goes inside the bottle. So you can see it from the top view. view. At this point, we were splitting three ways. We were sending it to a commercial lab, but we no longer do that. Um, but uh, we have everything contained in a bucket. And so then we split it in the field and then we, we send it out to our laboratories. We have the, the UN sample, we do virus concentration and that's what my team focused on at the medical school. We do this at the medical school because they have the facilities. We concentrate the viruses at the medical school and then we split it amongst three different laboratories, two labs in Miami and one lab at, in New York. And this is what it looks like in the lab um, with our various samples. The process of sample analysis requires that we take our sewage and at the top you can see our virus, we, we spike our sewage with a virus called OC43, which is a beta coronavirus, very, very similar, but not the same as SARS-CoV-2. So we use that to test our recovery controls, make sure that what we're doing, we're recovering the, the virus. We add salt and we acidify. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the viruses and we're salting them. So we're adding positive charge. We acidify, so it's still more positive. And we put it through these electronegative filters that are negative charge. So these filters capture the particles, but they also ca capture the virus. The virus is very tiny. And so they would go through the filter, but because the filter is negative and they are positive, theoretically they get stuck. So we're doing electronegative filtration. Uh, this just uh, shows you a little bit more detail about what we do in the, in the lab. Uh, we have these, there's the electronegative filter at the very top. There, um, once we pass our sample through, after we acidify and add the salt, we fold it and we put it in these five mineral epidural tubes with DNA RNA shield in them, which then lice the virus and releases it into the, the liquid phase there. And then it's these tubes that we then supply to the three laboratories that then do the PCR analysis or even more interesting things. So this is the, these are the, this is the workflow for our samples. We have three concentrates that we develop. One goes to Mark Sharkey's lab at the Center for AIDS Research. It just happens that HIV is an RNA virus and so is, uh, so is uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's amazing what Mark can do. Mark Sharkey, um, he is amazing. And he develops methods. And I remember when we were working in oceans and human health, we're trying to duplex, meaning to do two organisms, two targets at the same time. He's able to do that. He, I mean, it's just, and he designs his own primers and pro, it's amazing um, his capabilities. And he's the one who developed the DCB2 PCR method. We also send the samples to Sean Williams lab at the Oncogenomics Shared Resource. And they have um, very um, outstanding um, sequencing capabilities. Um, Sean Williams, lab analyzed for us on RT-PCR kind of thing, but since he has a sequencing process, he also does 
the targeted sequencing there. And then every month we ship our samples to New York and it goes to this work for you. So we do metagenomics. So not only are we doing SARS CoV 2, but this is a research project. We're doing the whole, all the microorganisms that are in the snake, just about all the viruses. So, what are our results? Okay, this is the campus results. On the left hand side, we have the number of cases and we have the date on the bottom. The gray bars correspond to students, the gold bars correspond to people, I mean, to people, of course, staff and faculty over time. And this is in the COVID, um, in the COVID dashboard. So, all this data is publicly available. And you can see on campus, we had about four waves of COVID. Adding in our wastewater numbers on this axis, so it's a quarter of magnitude, factor 10. Our detection limits for wastewater are on the order of about 100. We superimpose our wastewater numbers. These are weekly numbers. For wastewater, every square corresponds to a weekly sample. We take a moving average, compare it to the moving average of, this, of the student and faculty staff populations, and there's a pretty good match um, between the two. The fall semester worked, the match was really good. The spring semester, it wasn't as good. And you know, what we're seeing here, there was a, a drop off, especially we saw this in really fantastic drop off once the, the vaccine op, um, option was available for the students. We see the wastewater numbers go down, we see the new cases go down. What would you call it, Anna? Um, July, we're starting to see these big spikes. And we don't understand because it's not really resulting in the people. We think it has something to do with the Delta variant, maybe having to do with the fact that people who are vaccinated may be shedding and not seeking testing. So our relationship between wastewater and people has been changing. We think maybe because of vaccination and because of uh, the Delta variant. I ran out of time because I want to have a few times, for, a little bit of time for questions. So I'm just going to, you know, we, we spent a lot of time looking at manholes and how you collect the sample. And we conducted uh, various experiments to confirm, you know, the, the scale. Um, we focused a lot of the hypotheses that we were testing is how do you collect the sample? Are you going to collect the sample from the building scale, the cluster scale, or the community scale? And we designed experiments for that purpose. And I'm just going to skip over. And in a nutshell, our conclusions are that at the building scale, huge variability in, in, on the now to hour basis. That's where we need composite samples, but that's where usually you don't have a composite sample. You end up with something like this, which is a grass sample. The wastewater treatment plant, which where the signal is more Uniform is usually where the, the composite samplers are, but that's not where you need the composite samplers. So it's where the plus. Uh, we, we tested whether or not that, you know, when, when we were looking at the sample, I was worried that once we collect the sample, it's going to start degrading very quickly. That signal, the SARS, it's a pretty, the RNA is pretty stable. I think it's inside. I don't think the, the virus falls apart as quickly as I had thought. So the, once it's in the sewage, it's pretty stable in there. And we have 24 hours and the, and the numbers are pretty consistent. So I'm going to leave it there because I know I ran out of time uh, so that we have five minutes for questions and answers. So we still have a lot of work to do here. In the world Thank you, Helena. Yeah, thank you. By viable. Viable means that it can infect people. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, we, uh, there are have historic studies looking at the viability, and it the actual viability tends to go away very quickly. But the, act, the ability to retain, the, extract the RNA stays there for a long time. So, and again, I think it's because of the envelope layer. I think that dissolves, and therefore, once that dissolves, it, it's no longer viable. It cannot infect. But you still have the inner capsule. Well, the outer capsule of the virus that protects the RNA. And so, and that remains stable. Thank you very much. I mean, I think this is a very fascinating topic from the people who have
and that's what I find very fascinating too. My colleagues, you know, uh, we spend so much time talking about the techn the techniques of PCR and the sequencing, and um, but yeah, what I find fascinating is like the front end of collecting the samples. I feel very fortunate that I have um, researchers that are willing to take these samples and uh, analyze them and are experts in those details. So and I, I like the science that. that comes out from this kind of data, like. You know, you guys do the work, and then there is like so much that you can do with it. It's it's overwhelming, yeah. and so I try to stay focused on my sam my little world of sample collection. Mm -hmm. But yeah, trying to put it all together is just really yeah, that's the challenge, and it's just there's so many moving parts. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I, yeah, I think um, I I guess it depends on what clock I use. Yeah. Um, yeah. It looks like I've run out of time. Thank right, you, everybody. That was perfect. Yeah, thank you, Elena, again.